Uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Marky Duralan. This is uh, our uh, the third of our law in context uh, series. Um, we had uh, first uh, we heard from Dr. in the first series from um, uh, Louis Brown in the second. We have one more that I just want to make sure you all know about uh, on November 11th. Again, with uh, Louis Brown. Uh, on uh, the role of religious freedom and health care and human flourishing. Um, but on, on this occasion, we have uh, Professor Rooney, who is our the, the, the Lumen Lages Fellow at the Center for Law and the Human Person. Uh, and a uh, person I greatly respect, and I'm really looking forward to hearing on the subject of how separate are the powers, the common good, and political responsibility. So please uh, uh, join me in welcoming. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope we have a uh, engaging and fruitful time together. A note that this is or will be recorded. I'm not sure if it's started yet. Um, and then let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And you shall renew the face of the earth in the Father and Spirit. Amen. Today's presentation addresses the separation of our branches of government in light of the common good and political responsibility. My thesis is that the branches are separate in function, but share the same end. That end is the common good. And that good materially affects how the branches should exercise their powers. To support my thesis, I will first explore the structure and content of the common good. I then address its impact on the exercise of federal powers, including the judicial power. I advocate for a thick common good that is universal and necessary. As a competing proposal, I summarize a thin common good, which is limited to a coordinated function and pursues goods only at the individual level. The choice between the thick and thin common good is not a matter of preference, strategy, or even prudence, but is ontological and necessary. The universal and thick common good exists, and therefore it requires all political communities to participate in it. Although the presentation today is intended to stand on its own, it is also a kind of sequel to my last presentation on why law needs philosophy and God. I've distributed a handout that includes an outline of my presentation and a glossary of terms. I hope to speak for about 40 minutes and then open the floor to the discussion. The thick common good. In describing the political common good as thick, I rely on the philosophical writings of Thomas Aquinas that are grounded in the domain of reason. I emphasize the domain of reason to underscore that I am not advocating an integralism that requires an assent of faith or a subordination to ecclesial authority. I contend that all of my premises and conclusions are demonstrable by natural reason and are thus suitable for the temporal political order. I locate my reading of Thomas within the literature uh, to locate my reading of Thomas within the literature, I rely on Father Lawrence Duan and especially our own Father Aquinas Gilbo, as well as professors John Goyette, Gregory Froelich, and Stephen Long. Those authors and I also rely on the seminal work of Charles de Koenig. Any errors in reporting their good work are my own. The common good is the perfecting end of the community as a whole. By a good, I mean the end for which a thing exists and acts. When the thing achieves its end, 
it has attained the fullness of its being and thus its perfection. The bud is perfected in the bloom of the flower. By a common good, I mean the good end and perfection of a community as a unified and real whole, not just an aggregation of parts. A sports team illustrates a community as a real whole. The team is more than a collection of players wearing the same uniform. The reality of both the whole and the end that perfects the whole is central to my thesis. The common good, like the team, is not a platform for individual achievements. Rather, the common good is attained through the cooperation of the parts in pursuit of a common substantive purpose, victory for the team. The common good is thus mutually participated and is not just the sum of isolated activities. Human nature requires social life for perfection and is naturally inclined to the mutually participative political common good. Thomas observes that man has a natural inclination to live in society. He adds, quote, the city is initially made for the sake of living, but men not only live, but they live well, inasmuch as through the laws of the city, the life of men is ordered toward the virtues. I contend that the thick common good is a participative civic friendship that is ordered to a collective life of virtue. The common good distinguished from the individual good. An individual good, such as food, perfects, the, perfects only the individual. The individual good is possessed exclusively and is not communicable to any other person. Although one can share with others an individual good, such as pasta, the portion shared becomes the other's individual good. Individual goods do not unite one with another or perfect others. Common goods are higher than individual goods because common goods have a greater perfective and unitive capacity. A common good perfects and unifies the whole as a real entity. The team is unified by seeking victory and is perfected in attaining. The common good is enhanced, not diminished by participation. Consider the victory parade in which tens of thousands of fans participate. The more participants, the greater the victory celebration and the greater the diffusion of goodness among the participants. The common good thus differs from an individual good in time, not just degree. The players work for the good of the team as different from and more noble than the individual good of any player in his own right. Thomas observes pithily, quote, the part loves the good of the whole as becomes a part, not however to refer the good of the whole to itself, but rather to refer itself to the good of the whole, end quote. Individual goods or virtues, however, are necessary for the realization of the common good. To be a good team player, one must have good individual skills. But the team player orders his individual skills to the common good, which elevates those skills to a higher order. Thomas identifies a unique and supreme moral virtue, which he calls general or legal justice, that directs individual virtues to the higher and more noble common good. This is not to say that the political common good consumes the entire good of man. Common good is an analogical term and refers to the ends of a hierarchy of communities. That hierarchy ranges from a friendship of two to a family, to a political community, to the order of the whole universe, 
and to God himself. Each community has functions that are proper to itself according to the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity. When viewed within a hierarchy of common goods, the political common good has its own proper substance and activities. As we will see, the political common good is normed by and ordered to higher common goods, such as the eternal and natural laws and the supreme good from which they flow. The common good and individual goods are not competitive, hostile, or alien. As noted, a true individual good is ordered to and elevated by the common good. According to Aquinas, quote, everything loves its proper good on account of the common good, close quote, the content of the common good. So far, we've defined the common good as perfecting both a community as a real whole and its participating parts. We now must say more about what the content of the common good is and what political life order to the thick common good might look like. The content of the common good is the collective life of virtue. We participate in that collective life through a civic friendship in which we refer our personal virtues to the relationships with other citizens. Lawrence Duan observes, quote, Thomas conceives the completeness of the community as a completeness that leads to virtue. Virtue is the goal, and the act of the virtue is the means. City living imbues the whole community with order towards virtue. Further, quote, St. Thomas stresses that the goal of the political society and its leaders is authentic human virtue. Thomas importantly traces authentic human virtue to divine justice <laughs> and thereby to the true universal and supreme good. Thomas calls the lawgiver to be, quote, fixed on true good, verum bonum, which is the common good regulated according to divine justice, close quote. God's divine justice and wisdom establish the eternal law, which leads man to the common good and universal happiness. Citizens participate in the true and universal good collaboratively through civic friendship. Thomas observes that, quote, every law aims at establishing friendship, either between man and man or between man and God. Friendship thus has an affinity with the common good. Aristotle identifies friendship as the truest form of justice and the bond that unites a political community. The virtuous activities of civic friendship perfect the common life. Those activities include the shared pursuit of knowledge, especially knowledge of God as well as justice in all its parts, and the tranquility that arises from unity in the true good. They also include the mutual encouragement of political fortitude, temperance, and prudence, as well as a communal acknowledgement of our debt to a sovereign creator. A civic friend loves the good of civic friendship as becomes a friend, not to refer the good of friendship to himself, but rather to refer himself to the good of civic friendship. The true good as originating in God and prescribed by the eternal and natural law is the nub of the thick common good and is central to my thesis on the single end of our three branches of government. As we will see, the thin common good is agnostic as to the true good, allows each citizen to determine his own good, and requires others to respect those determinations 
as legitimate. The thin common good envisions political neutrality, order to self-determination, in lieu of collaborative friendship, order to the universal good and common perfection, the thin common good. For contrasting understanding of the political common good, I rely on the work of Lee Strang, a law professor from the University of Toledo College of Law. In a 2019 book on originalism's promise, Strang offers a clear and candid description of what he and I call a thin or coordinated common good. Strang specifies the thin common good as, quote, coordinated because it is, quote, grounded, not grounded, in contested conceptions of justice and good and does not rely on, quote, controversial claims about human nature and metaphysical propositions, close quote. Strang claims that the end of the coordinated good is individual human flourishing, not the perfection of the community as an ontological whole. Strang describes the common good as that, quote, which enables society's members to pursue their own flourishing and as consisting of the means by which Americans freely and rationally secure their human flourishing, close quote. Strang thus orders the coordinated function of the whole to the realization of individual goods. The part becomes superior to the whole. Strang emphasizes, quote, the common good is the ensemble of conditions in a society that enables the society's members to flourish as individuals, close quote. He further observes, quote, with the common good, individual flourishing can occur more fruitfully, and humans, therefore, have reason to support the common good, close quote. Even if, Strang asserts, quote, one believes that law generally, and the Constitution in particular, serve a function other than securing human flourishing, the law as coordination account may serve that alternative function too, close quote. Melissa Michella, a philosophy professor at Notre Dame, supports the coordinated role of government as a way to facilitate flourishing of individuals and what she calls sub-political communities. Quote, sub-political communities lack self-sufficiency because they require mutual coordination and thus an overarching coordinated activity to justify and efficiently address coordinated needs. Among those coordinated needs are, quote, the provision of public goods and services, such as utilities and infrastructure, defense against external threats, and protection from internal threats, and the administration of justice, close quote. Like Strang, Michelle is candid about the narrow scope of the common good. Quote, the specifically political common good is thus limited and subsidiary, corresponding to the areas in which subcult political communities lack self-sufficiency, close quote. She defines the quote, the political common good as the conditions that facilitate the pursuit of flourishing by individuals and sub-political communities. Again, the parts transcend the political whole. Michelle rightly acknowledges that, quote, there are important similarities between this account of politics and a liberal account. Michelle observes that both her account and the liberal account of the common good, quote, support limited government, the rule of law, respect for civil liberty, separation of church and state, and respect for the private sphere of freedom from government intrusion. The same could be said about Strang's thick account of the common good. As an aside, both Strang and Michelle acclaim to operate within a natural law framework. 
But that framework, as they interpret it, prioritizes individual flourishing over the flourishing of the political community as a whole. De Koenig, Goyette, and Fathers Duan and Gilbo have each undertaken, successfully in my view, to refute that priority. Thick over thin, the end as the cause of causes. <clears throat> An end or final cause is first as a matter of intention, last as a matter of execution, and governs all action in between. So, to use the Stephen Long example, I first intend to go to the grocery store, and then I find my keys, open the car door, drive through town, and finally arrive at the grocery store, my final destination. The final cause is thus the cause of causes, because it is the first to be thought and governs all actions until it is accomplished. The political common good is the end of the political community. It is the reason for the formation of the community, serves as its north star, and determines all political activity. Correctly identifying the common good or the cause of causes will define political responsibility and how the branches are to execute their powers. Whether the common good is thick or thin, is an ontological question regarding the real end of society. It is not a matter of preference, a strategic question, or even a prudential question about the best means to attain the end. The ontological question depends on whether a true good exists, and if so, what sort of good it is. Is the true good universal? Does it originate in God? Is it found on founded on eternal and natural law? And does it call citizens to a collective life of virtue in civic friendship? I propose affirmative answers to those questions in line with John Paul II's endorsement in Fides et Ratio of, quote, the human capacity to know the truth the objective truth, close quote. That truth includes, quote, the moral good, which has as its ultimate foundation in the supreme good, God himself, close quote. The real existence of the true supreme good, which is the main premise of my presentation, requires a political community to acknowledge as its end the thick common good and to seek to realize it in each time and place. The thin common good refers those ontological questions to individuals for resolution. They seek their own flourishing on their own terms and demand that each respect the other's determinations as equally legitimate. As the contemporary saying goes, you do you, I'll do me, and we'll be good. The result is a treaty of agnosticism, which then becomes the cause of causes that orders the society to an atomistic relativism. Anything of substance with a universal jurisdiction, the true good, the eternal law, the natural law, is foreclosed from the political arena. The alternative to a coordinated agnosticism is not an oppressive totalitarianism. The thick common good does not contemplate a platonic form that hovers over the political community and that authorities invoke to suppress natural rights and political expression. Rather, the thick common good consists of participatory conversation among civic friends which constitutes the common life. The object of that conversation is to identify the best means of arranging the collective life toward the end of the true good. Disagreement regarding those means, and perhaps even the good itself, will arise. But the purpose of civic discussion 
is to attain a working consensus on the common good and its implementation. The basis of friendship is likeness. And unless we can achieve such a working consensus, disintegration will exceed integration. Political responsibility, separate functions, and a common end. In Aquinas's letter to the King of Cyprus on the responsibilities of a ruler, Thomas observes that, quote, to govern is to lead the thing governed in a suitable way toward its proper end, close quote. He then adds, quote, the end of a multitude is to live virtuously, for men form a group for the purpose of living well together, a thing which the individual man living alone could not attain. Therefore, virtuous life is the end for which men gather together, close quote. In a democracy, the ruling function has been divided into separate branches with separate powers subject to oversight by the electorate. The end, however, to which those branches and powers are ordered remains the common good, and each voter and official retains the responsibility to promote the common good. Those who rule, quote, should have for their principal concern the means by which the multitude may live well, close quote. The powers of our branches are specified by our Constitution as a positive law instrument, but the obligation to advance the common good and its content <clears throat> does not arise from positive law, but from the existence of the true good and the community itself. Our Constitution's citation of a more perfect union, justice, tranquility, and the general welfare, thus do not specify an end that was constructed by our founding, but rather affirms an ontologically prior and universal common good, the separate branches. We know that legislators' discretion is broad in attending to the common good, as Thomas observes, quote, the common good comprises many things, wherefore law should take account of many things as to persons, as to matters, and as to times, close quote. For the legislature, the common good and the natural and eternal law that informs it is a positive norm, an affirmative norm that guides the enactment of human law. Legislators are thus responsible for leading the polity in a suitable way toward its proper end. They cannot substitute their own end in place of living well in virtuous life, and they cannot approve what the eternal law condemns. The executive power should encourage civic friendship, unity, and gratitude more than self-sovereignty and individual flourishing. Presidential proclamations that have led 18th and 19th century Thanksgiving Day celebrations illustrate a communal recognition of the universal good and the God from whom the universal good comes. Limitations on judicial power. The judicial branch is of most interest to us. Alexander Hamilton observed that the legislature, not the judiciary, quote, prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated, close quote. The judiciary, in contrast, quote, can take no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment, end quote. <clears throat> but judgment it has. And in exercising judgment, the court necessarily interprets the law that it must apply. Thomas respects the limits that are inherent to the judicial function. He instructs that in most cases, a judge should render judgment according to written laws, positive laws. He so concludes, however, after observing that laws manifest both natural and positive right. Natural right arises from the normative, natural teleological order, flows from divine wisdom and justice, and is apportioned by eternal law. 
Positive right results from a public agreement among citizens as expressed in positive laws or through private contracts. When human precept conflicts with divine command. Thomas recognizes that man can, quote, by common agreement, make a thing to be just, provided that it not be, of itself, contrary to natural justice. And in such matters, positive right has its place, close quote. He cautions, however, that, quote, if the thing is, of itself, contrary to natural right, the human will cannot make it just, for instance, by decreeing that it is lawful to steal or to commit adultery. Close quote. Judgment should not be rendered according to a law that is contrary to natural right. According to Aquinas, quote, just as the written law does not give force to natural right, so neither can it diminish or annul its force, because man's will cannot change nature. Hence, if the written law contains anything contrary to natural right, it is unjust and has no binding force. Wherefore, such documents are to be called not laws, but rather corruptions of laws. And consequently, judgment should not be delivered according to them. Close quote. Thomas does not, however, authorize the judge to rewrite the corrupted law as if he were a legislator. Still, the injunction that an unjust law is no law at all controls when the law violates a divine good, such as the primary precept of the natural law. So if a plaintiff's case depends on a law that violates a divine good, the case should be dismissed for failure to state a legal claim. We must obey God, not man. From Thomas's understanding of law and the common good, we can infer the principle that the common good should serve as an interpretive and negative norm for the judiciary in contrast to the affirmative norm that the common good provides to the legislature. To the extent that the judiciary can construe an ambiguous law in accordance with natural law, it should do so on the presumption that legislators act for the common good. To the extent, however, that a law unambigu unambiguously violates the natural law, the common good acts as a negative norm and prohibits judgment from being rendered according to the corrupted law. But do Articles 1 and 3 of the Constitution allocate decisions about the common good and determinations of the natural and eternal law exclusively to the legislature? Is the judiciary by a kind of role morality foreclosed from assessing whether positive right is contrary to natural right? I suggest no is the answer to those questions. First, the judge is obliged to protect the common good by virtue of its universal jurisdiction. No positive enactment or apportionment of powers can divest the judge of that responsibility. Second, the judicial function is to render justice according to natural and positive right. Aristotle calls the judge the guardian of justice. Thomas states, quote, a judge is so called because he asserts the right and the right is the object of justice, close quote. Natural right precedes positive law, follows from the order of ends that is conceived by divine wisdom and justice, and is prescribed by eternal law, practical realities. Would a contemporary judge's refusal, based on the common good, to enforce a statute that, for example, protects abortion, 
especially after Dobbs, prompt claims of judicial misbehavior, calls for immediate reversal, and perhaps even efforts of impeachment. Probably yes, at least as to some of those. But the judges enforcing the statute presents a predicament of a different and perhaps more serious sort. The judiciary's rendering judgment according to legislation that violates a primary precept of the natural law, such as the right to life, purports to annul the objective right and to separate law from nature. It also abuses the judicial function, which is to administer right as the object of justice. In other professions, so-called conscience clauses protect personnel from engaging in conduct that may constitute cooperation with evil. For example, the church amendments permit medical professions in some circumstances to decline to participate in abortion and sterilization without suffering discrimination. A judge should be accorded a similar latitude, separate and apart from uncertain recusal practices, to decline to render judgment according to a purported statute that may plausibly draw him into a cooperation with evil. But recusal alone is not the proper resolution of the judge's predicament. Recusal does not acquit the judicial function of rendering the right as the object of justice. If the alleged basis for a lawsuit contravenes a primary precept of the natural law, such as the right to life, the judicial function obliges the judge to dismiss the suit. For the latter kind of judicial latitude to become practically acceptable, we need a public consensus that judges should render justice, not just a mechanical application of legislation. We also need an acknowledgement that justice has an objective dimension, that law is more than what man says it is, and that legal positivism, whether in the legislature or the judiciary, is contrary to the real existence of natural and eternal law and the true good. Martin Luther King made the case for those propositions from his jail cell in Birmingham in 1963, quote, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. <clears throat> To put it in, term, in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law, end quote. We should make the same case in today's public square. Although we cannot expect immediate results, reality cannot be denied in perpetuity. Let us engage our secular peers on the objective dimension of justice, the supremacy of eternal and natural law, and the existence of the universal good and God as its source. <clears throat> Conclusion. The thick common good calls for civic friendship in a collective life of virtue, leads to shared happiness, and perfects the political community as a real whole and its members as participatory parts. Our three branches of government differ in function and their respective powers, but they share the responsibility to seek and protect the thick common good. That includes providing the judiciary with the latitude to acquit its responsibility to render justice according to both natural and positive right, and to assess positive law in light of natural law. When public officials and citizens place the true good as their North Star, as their cause of causes, the polity will flourish as a community and diffuse that goodness to its many members. Thank you.
happy to take objections or questions or are you kidding? So, uh, I guess so. yeah, I loved your talk. It was great. And I think um, it was helpful. Uh, it was helpful for me and after reading a fair amount of uh, the international on having our book and some of those are basically talked about it like, out, out there. Just, you know, the way that you are it, it just feels kind of needs to see that I've been intellectually for a long Um in terms of like the practical um, uh, execution of what you articulated, how do you, what could you see? Well, I do think if, if, I do think that we need to bring God back into the city. Um, part of the, part of the liberal movement has been this sort of creating space for individual goods. And, and part of that is in excluding prayer from public schools. So since the 1950s or 60s, God has just not been part of the secular society, of our political community. God has not been a part of that. And I know from personal experience, many people who are in their 30s are almost entirely biblically illiterate. So Adam and Eve has no meaning to them. And it is, it is, and it's also interesting to observe that it, it's hard to identify a society that is not strongly monotheistic, that has not prevented abortion, exposure of infants, euthanasia, assisted suicide, so that the individual seeking his own flourishing will exercise that power over the, over the week. And the only thing that will restrain that exercise of power is a superior power and a superior moral order. So the long and short of it is it must begin in the public square. And some forms of natural law, as you know, speak only of practical reason as separate from speculative reason. So natural law is a precept residing in the mind that has no connection to eternal law or God. Now, although I don't agree with that on the merits, but the strategic consequences of that have been to remove God from the public square in line with liberalism, even though their justification is different from liberalism. Yes. You said uh, we need to uh, practically implement this by bringing God back into the public square. But whose idea of God? Um, I believe that even among different Christian religions, uh, the idea of God and even right. human nature is different. So human nature being different will have different ideas of calling good. Now, do you say whose idea of God? There is a Bishop Barron series on the mystery of God. And the first segment in that series of six lectures is entitled, What Do We Mean by God? And that he tells the anecdote that when someone sneezed, the response was, God bless you. The reply to the response was, what do you, which God do you mean? <laughs> and and, uh, and Bishop, Barron point, Bishop Barron's point in that lecture is that we're not thinking of God as an oppressor. <clears throat> so that, and this is actually the roots of our problem, so that in 19th century agnosticism and atheism People like Feuerbach would say, in order to say yes to man, we may say we must say no to God. And, and that concept has grown through the late 19th and into the 20th century. So, but by God, I mean this is not may not have a lot of resonance to you immediately, but St. Thomas in the second question of the Sum and in the third article identifies five via for coming to the existence of God. And at the end of that, of those vias, he says, this is what we mean when we say God. He then proceeds through the next eight or nine questions to identify the divine attributes. And then he goes on through the first part of the first part and talks about divine providence and divine governance and God as all good and the source of all goodness. And from all of that, we get a sense of the normative natural teleology 
which is the structure and ends of reality. So we have objective criteria by which to judge what God's will is as he's expressed it in created reality. It's not just what I think or what you think. It's what the order of being tells us. Let me yield there and see if that helps at all. Um, so it's not it's not a creedal God. It's more a God of the philosophers, but it's still a very powerful God and source of goodness whose will is reflected in the normativity of natural teleology. Which is why I say I'm not talking, I, I'm talking about the, the domain of reason and that this is not a sense of integralism in which we are subordinating ourselves to ecclesial authority and requiring some sort of assent of faith of the supremacy of the Pope, for example. Yes? No, I Oh, okay. I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have okay. So going to bring God back into the public square, which I, I agree, agree with in the abstract, but when you mentioned prayer in school in order to kind of reorient ourselves towards the thick common good that's necessary for a political community to flourish, what do you mean by that? Which well, that's prayer? a very good question. That's an ex excellent question. And I would say um, almost anything but not something that is so creedal that would make a pluralistic society of students feel as if their God wasn't included. Uh, you also could have called me on talking about biblical literacy. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but Genesis does talk about the same God that Thomas does. Yeah. Yes? Um, so I had a question um, kind of regarding uh, the common good in the context of a polity. Um, so with Aristotle and St. Thomas, you have a large focus on the common good of a city, um, and that's, at the time, a smaller, more homogenous city yes. uh, culturally. Yes. Um, and pursuing the common good uh, within that context is no easy task. Um, seeing, especially since the Industrial Revolution, the rapidly increasing scope of what is considered to be like a singular community and the various subcultures which have arisen that sometimes conflict um, on matters of legitimate determination and things like that. Um, how much harder has the pursuit of the common good become and how ought we go about just working out a consensus among these uh, spots of legitimate disagreement? Great question. Um, and it hits upon really two things. One is subsidiary and solidarity. And it also hits upon the difference between a concord of wills and differences in opinion. And a concord of wills refers to the major and determinative end of a good life. And differences of opinion typically refer to the means by which we get there. Now, on the first point, subsidiary and solidarity, the amount, the type of civic friendship that we will have with California will differ, but it might stem from that which we have in common, the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, things that, and, and, is, and, and common national values that were uh, expressed in presidential proclamations in this, 18th and 19th centuries. The, the, the basic consensus, and if you look at the pew polls, 85% of the people are happy to grant, yes, God exists. Now, they may not appreciate what difference God makes in their lives, but they will at least stipulate to the proposition that God exists. Um, and the so-called nuns, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Well, if you're going to be spiritual, that means you believe in the spiritual soul and you're obviously spiritual with some supernatural power in mind. Um, so it's 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 a, a unanimity on the on the overall goals of society that we can ask for at the national level. Then at the more local level, we have a more intimate friendship, as it were, in which we talk about the specifics of our local lives. But Congress makes a lot of laws that determine the way to our common good. And we hope to have a better consensus on the fundamentals that or, that or ought to frame those laws. Is that responsive? Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I stuck around, Bill. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so I had a, a little bit of a, a kind of question like uh, Mr. Dodd asked, but uh, since he asked it, I'm going to phrase it in a slightly different way, which is A, well, two, so two questions. Yes. A, um, what do you think the scope of a judge's um, uh, thoughts about the natural law, imposition of the natural law as a check on positive law would be. So you mentioned abortion as an example, legislative or, or a school prayer might be another. Um, how how thick a uh, view do you have about the way in which the natural law sort of ought to supervene uh, as a practical matter? So yeah. that's number one. And number two, a more practical question, which is um, in order for judges to become judges, they have to get, well, they have to be nominated and they have to be confirmed. So suppose somebody were to ask one of these nominees. As they did Justice Thomas. As they did Justice Thomas. By Joe Biden. Uh, what, what do you mean by this? And what do you mean when you, you've had all these writings, right? You, you've adopted Rudy's approach. This recording. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, um, should that judge... Uh, just be sort of full on frank about uh, what they're going to do. And if they are uh, in a society like ours, how would that judge ever expect to be confirmed um, in the first place? So in other words, or, or, or the alternative might be maybe the judge should sort of um, uh, hedge as all judicial nominees do a little bit now and then wait until confirmation in order to uh, let the Jolly Roger fly a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, first of all, I don't think a judge who is transparent about his understanding of justice as consisting of natural right and positive right would be confirmed in today's climate. Um, now, I find, I think that the judge, the sitting judge, uh, in today's world is in a very, very hard spot. So I recently read a long opinion by uh, a judge whom I believe to be devoutly, to have been devoutly Catholic. Uh, and he goes through a long 60 to 70 page uh, analysis of a law prohibiting partial birth abortion. Um, and it's, you know, well, it, it's brutally specific in the detail, factual detail. And he gets to the end and declares that law invalid on the, on the basis of a Supreme Court precedent that's called Spenberg. And the reason was that it didn't have a health uh, exception. It had a life exception, but not a health exception. But another. And a variety of other uh, lower courts did as well. Um, but the judge said at the end of the opinion, um, I'm a judge, I am governed by the Supreme Court of the United States, and this is the Supreme Court's precedent. And he did a fine analytical job of sorting through all of the, uh, all of the complex facts and medical opinions um, and said, so the answer is invalid. <laughs> now, you know, it's hard for me to think that in order for that case to have had standing, there had to be a plaintiff who had a real and present intent to do a partial birth abortion. And this law was what stood between this moment and that moment. And this public official knocked that obstacle away, which had the obvious and per se consequence of permitting the partial birth abortion. Um, and it's hard not to think of that in some way as being at least arguably a cooperation with evil. <clears throat> and for the judge to say, and understandably, I mean, I've practiced law for 40 years, and I know that what judges' roles are in the courtroom, but for the judge to have to say, I owe my allegiance to the Supreme Court as my superior. They're owing their allegiance to the prince, not the emperor. And that's a, that's a real problem. That's a real predicament. Um, so although I've never had the opportunity to be a judge 
and I'm probably not politically felicitous enough to even get that opportunity, I'm afraid I wouldn't seek that opportunity because I would be too concerned about my conflict in participating in our system as a judge has and dealing with the corruptions that our legislature by way of our society is handing to the judge. So in the short term, I at least think there ought to be the church event so that people like this judge can say, no, no, I'm gonna recuse myself from this. This is not what I became a judge to do. And I'm happy to take any other conflict, but don't ask me to enforce laws that I think will place me in a position of plausibly cooperating with evil. Now, the whole concept of cooperating with evil, I want to note, is very complex. And uh, there are some people who think about uh, think of it in only an intentionalist way. So maybe the judge said to himself, I intend only to follow the Supreme Court. I don't intend to facilitate a partial birth abortion. And because of that intent, I'm in the clear. It's only a material or remote participation in evil. But I think that there are other theories that would say you've got to look at the nature of the act and its per se consequences and take those on board. Yes. Thank you for your lecture. It was insightful and very good. Um, I wanted to ask about, you mentioned a few times about people coming together um, to attain a certain end, right? And I wanted to ask to what extent in our society where people are born into a society or a polis, does that kind of change the conclusion at all? Or is there kind of an argument to be made for those who do not uh, intentionally and voluntarily opt in to that? Right. No, it's interesting that Thomas uh, talks about, and Father uh, Aquinas Gilbo discusses this in a lecture, and he uses men named Joseph Bobbick in an article he wrote to uh, sort of ground this analysis. There are two forms of conversation. There's sort of a passive form in which we're thrown in to a pot together, and then there's an active form. And the, the passive form is our being born into a society. And are all being, we're all being Americans and part of the United States of America. That puts us in the pot, as it were. And then we have the active role of conversing with one another about what our common end is. So it's not a matter in saying, well, I didn't, I didn't choose to come into this society, so I shouldn't be bound by the common good that it has selected. Because one of the points I'm trying to make is that it's not a discretionary selection because the true good exists, because the natural and eternal law exists, they inform the common good and frame the legislation that we have and the way we ought to relate to one another. And that should be true in the United States, in France, in India, no matter which country you would choose to flee to in light of the bad things that are happening here, as you may perceive. Yes, Lewis. Um, I found it helpful and compelling the use of the letter from the Birmingham jail because it 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 shows a a very a practical application of I think what you articulated um, that that radically changed American history like in the lifetimes of some in this room on the basis of the moral right right exactly so um, I I thought that that's um, really helpful. Um, uh, and I, but I think it's easier and politically for legislators to try to tackle this than it is for the for the judge. Um, is there any um, is there any instruction from the use of equity in the early American legal system for what you're talking about uh, in the lecture? Well, there was in the uh, late 1700s all the way through to 1850, much more of a judicial receptivity to natural law as part of the juridical system. And Stuart Banner in The Decline of Natural Law uh, counts by 1830 or so, five justices who arguably would have supported the use of natural law in judicial review under our constitution. You know, and, in, and obviously we all know the Ninth Amendment is there and that rights not specified in the first eight amendments are reserved to the people, not legal persons where you can somehow 
redefine the human being, but they're reserved to the people. And so there, there, is, there seemed to have been a contemplation on the founders' part that they couldn't itemize all of the rights that would need protection. Um, so the answer to your question is, at, in, the culture of our, in the culture and legal tradition of our founding, there was much more of an acknowledgement of God and of the relevance and appropriateness of natural law in the juridical system. And I think the only way we get there, again, is to remove the division between God and the common goal. Yes. Um, so it's kind of a two-part question. Versus reference to <clears throat> you said monotheism is the only one that believes in these things, um, about abortion, suicide, so on and so forth. But then you say that in school prayer, it should not be so creedal as to, uh, in a pluralistic society such as ours, to not have those who do not believe in the same thing as you to feel as they're Absolutely. disjointed. Right. Um, I don't really understand how you can bring God back into society while also believing that you cannot exclude certain beliefs from that orientation back to society. So that's another very good point. And, and the, uh, the way I would address that is if somebody were, and this is entirely plausible, say, you know, I'm, I like that Greek culture. So I want to have all of the, the, the gods of the Greek history be the objects of our prayer. I think we have to be able as a society to take a stand of this is what we mean by God. And that God is simple, is one, is perfect, is the source of goodness, and that it makes no sense to think of two gods whose essence is their existence. Um, and then the second part of that question is along the lines of what you were saying to Professor DiGirolami about how you wouldn't want to be a judge today. I, I would not welcome it. I, I would much rather do this. Um, <laughs> so is this approach that we're looking at here, is this not even something that we, our generation, uh, the ones who are in school now, could do? Is it something that we need to reorient in our society in a way that our children are able to do that as justices, but not us ourselves? Mm -hmm. Well, Based I, on I, I, God I, I'm not so much, I'm not so big on tomorrow as opposed to today. Um, I think the first order of business is to amend the church amendments to include law and judges. And I say that because it would be a legislative uh, acknowledgement that judges may really have a problem with the statutes they're forced to deal with. And it would allow them within the conventional judicial system to opt out. And their simple opting out would be, in a sense, Martin Luther King style protest against that statute. And it would also, you know, in our, in this particularly the current milieu in which this issue is so divisive and volatile. Um, it would be an acknowledgement again by our community that we've got to find a way to sort through this and not put people in circumstances where they're forced to engage in conduct, the consequences of which they're very uneasy. Sort of left oriented, I guess, instead of not asked, looking at this side of the room as much. Okay. Any others? We're good. Oh, yes. Um, related to um, Trevor's question somewhat, and a question I asked earlier. Um, it might be true that there is like, if you see out like a God, like um, like the five fruits of God, very general. There's like, do good and avoid evil and various general things. But like law gets very detailed. Right. So now when we're starting to talk about contraception and abortion, like religions provide um, like specific ideas of human nature, like like God is just will, like Muslim and stuff like that. Right. Like now do we have to start picking to choose what religion has the best idea of human nature. Right. Uh, I don't know that um, 
you know, the reason I chose the right to life is it just seems like it is most fundamentally a primary precept of the natural law and a divine good. Um, other, other closer, more determination questions, I think you, you just have to take on a case by case basis and I, I, and see whether we can view them as differences of opinion for which a majority vote would prevail or a concord of wills and primary end, which should not be subject to a, a majority vote. And so I don't think we can give a comprehensive answer to your very good question, but more a schematic answer. That, and by the way, the primary precepts of the natural law are fundamentally thought of as the Decalogue, with the possible exception of the third commandment specifying the day on which we must acknowledge our debt to God or the time period by which we must do so. But more generally, yes, we have a debt to God that we must acknowledge, but the manner in which that's prescribed would not be a primary precept. Yes. Um, so well, now, you, now you have that. Yes. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, I guess the question that I was interested in was how the office of judge, the function of that office has shifted over time from Aristotle to St. Thomas to the American understanding, I guess, of founding, then also today, and kind of the evolution of that, and where it's currently going um, as far as what is the actual function of that office. So I, I don't want to uh, represent that I uh, researched the history on your good question. From looking at Thomas and reading literature about Thomas's understanding of justice and the judiciary, my immediate reaction is it hasn't changed much. The, the office of the judge has not changed much, um, at least as to its fundamental function when you have justice deciding cases, not writing laws. Um, I do think that once our society has become more positivistic and once God has been excluded from the public square, God has also been excluded from law and from the judge's domain. And that has been a radical change, which would be viewed as the difference between the, the traditional Roman traditional understanding and common law understanding of just, justice in the role of judge and the modern understanding of the judge with the individual as sovereign. That's it. Thank you.